right. We're here this afternoon, 407 in the afternoon. Yes, this is Meet Me at the Diner. Yes, this is Ann Eller. And today my very special guest is Senator Shane Massey. How you doing today, Shane? Doing great, doing great. Thanks for having me. Ann. Absolutely. We've got uh, listeners all over that are uh, wanting to hear what you have to say this afternoon. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, you know, um, I was looking over. You're, you're pretty young to be in the Senate down there. I'm going to have to give you a hug. Okay. <laughs> Can you see it on the air, <laughs> yeah. folks? Yeah. <laughs> An air hug here. But um, what made you decide to get into politics? You, you know, my... My typical response to that is, joking of course, is that I had too much to drink the night before I made the decision, and that is a joke of course because I don't even drink, Um, but um, you know, I I guess we all have a story about who are, about having a favorite teacher, right? Um, and that's the the case with me. My, um, the the teacher that had the most impact on me was a government and and a U.S. history teacher, and uh, she got me very interested in it, and that really just kind of built on my, I remember one of my very early memories of my father taking me with him to vote and it was these old voting machines you go in they pull the curtain behind you right and I got to pull the lever now it was the coolest thing ever how um, old were you then oh I was probably five five okay uh, and, and I, I still remember that to this day being able to do that um, and then that c- combined with um, just having a, a very meaningful and impactful um, teacher it just kind of built in this interest in me and so I've always been interested in civics and, and government and uh I, you know, the opportunity arose, so um, my wife said, look, quit fussing at the television, get off the couch and do something about it. So that's what we tried to do. Fortunately, it worked out. <laughs> okay. But did you ever have any other ideas of doing other? I mean, you're a lawyer. You went in, you became an attorney. Right. Um, you became an attorney because? Um, you know, along the same lines as what we're talking about with the with government, I mean, it, it all kind of fits together f- for me because um, it's about law, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I became interested in the law uh, because of, of, of government issues, and, and I wanted to go to law school because I wanted to have a better understanding of it. Um, and, and actually, when I went to law school, I really didn't have any intention of becoming a lawyer. I didn't want to. I didn't have any intention of practicing. I just wanted to go for the education, and then it kind of worked out where I figured. You got all these loans, you need to pay them back. So it might be good to get a job, too. Get a job, yeah. yeah. Well, what did you want to be if you didn't want to be an attorney? What did you want to be? Well, um... Or did you always want to be in politics? No, I wanted to be a professional baseball player, and I figured out pretty quick that wasn't going to work out. Uh, but when I when I first went to college, uh, my interest really was, was more in science and math. I, I, uh, I wanted to go into engineering. Um, realized pretty quickly that wasn't going to be the thing for me, and so then I decided I would go to law school. Hmm. Okay, well, that's an interesting choice. Right. Going off in a different direction. Well, I actually, you know, when I was at Clemson, I majored in chemistry. I got my degree in chemistry uh, and went to law school with that. So I don't know that I could tell you the difference between an acid and a base now. Right. Uh, but it worked out while, well while I was at Clemson. Wow. All right. Well, you are down in the Senate. We're going to be talking some about the Senate, but you're also an attorney um, in Aiken. That's right. I live in Edgefield and work in Aiken. And, and, how is you have a small law practice? You say there's three attorneys involved in it. That's right. What kind of cases do you handle? We do a lot of uh, civil defense type work. Uh, we do a lot of medical malpractice defense, representing the doctors, um, sometimes the hospitals and, and nursing homes, but primarily the doctors, and just do other general civil defense type work. You know, I'm curious, since um, the Affordable Care Act, has that affected any of your cases? I don't know that it's had any uh, direct impact on on our cases, um, but but you do see more and more um, hospitals buying up these small doctors' practices. Yes, that's happened um, a lot here in Greenwood. That's yeah. right, it's happening all over the place, um, and uh, that's that's having an impact because uh, what that does also is it brings most of the hospitals are. Um, government-owned facilities, and so that brings them under state protections, um, and, and that changes that changes lots of things. I mean, you're starting to see some impacts. I mean, you, you, you get complaints mm-hmm. from the doctors a lot, but it's not necessarily related to the reason they've been sued. Right, but, but it has having an effect, and the fact that the hospitals, and you know, most hospitals, I think, are, are non-profits, aren't they? That's right. Yeah. 
That's an interesting oxymoron, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you see a lot of the big places are nonprofits, um, lots of times. But yeah, but we have we have few uh, for-profit hospitals. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, I just wanted to ask about that. But as you're um, as you're um, working this year down in the Senate, how do you feel things are coming together as far as uh, what's happening down there? I mean, we can all read, and we're going to talk about some of the issues. But generally, how do you think the Senate is working this year? The, uh, the Senate this year is much different than it has been in in my previous years. This is my eighth year in okay. the Senate, and we have new leadership this year with the uh, election of uh, Senator Hugh Leatherman from Florence as the pro tem. Right. And uh, it, it's uh, it, it's just a completely different leadership style. And so the Senate has worked differently this year than we have in years past. I mean, I think in the last couple of years, we've gotten a good good number of things accomplished. And so far this year, we're, um, we haven't done a whole lot. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. We just heard it right here on WCRS. <laughs> Well, you you are uh, working on several things. In fact, one of the big things that you've been working on is this t uh, law for teenage driving and for getting your license and keeping your license. In fact, there was an, uh, an opinion piece in the Index Journal on March 31st, so that would have been Tuesday, saying that uh, this is a good thing. How's it coming right. through? I hadn't seen the I hadn't seen the opinion piece, but it sounds like someone very smart wrote it. Um, <laughs> okay. it I mean, look, the, the idea is when you look at the statistics for um, automobile crashes, or go even further, and you look at the deaths, um, the, a significant number of those involve inexperienced, mostly young drivers. Sure. And the idea is to try to ensure that those, those younger drivers, the inexperienced drivers, and, and really I should say inexperienced because I think it, that could apply regardless of age, but typically they're younger drivers. The, the idea is to ensure that they have a sufficient amount of training before we put them behind the wheel. Um, because uh, I, I'm not sure, looking at the statistics, that uh, we're giving them the training that they, they deserve and all the rest of us would like for them to have as well. Sure. Well, um, so what exactly does your bill um, state? Well, the, uh, what we're trying to do is to re require um, additional uh, require additional classroom time and even additional training time in the in the car uh, before the, the the inexperienced driver is is allowed to get the license. Um, and that would be a big change. A lot of the younger folks aren't going to like me too much if, if this were to, to were to actually happen. But the idea is to you know give people experience before you send them out there on their own, and, and so hopefully that would make them safer and make all the rest of us safer as well. You know, one of the big things, and and even though I know there's a law on the books about texting and uh, phones and this type of thing, people are still doing it. That's right. You know, we just passed the texting ban last year. Right. Uh, and and one of the reasons that people are still doing it is I think that the penalty is woefully inadequate. Uh, and hopefully we can go back at some point and try to try to strengthen that penalty. We um, we had to settle for a really lax penalty in order to get the bill passed. Um, it's part of the process. You know, you, you do what you got to do in order to get it passed. And we thought it was important to get it on the books mm -hmm. first of all. But also, I mean, it's it's also been part of the culture, and and it's so easy to do. Sure. So you got to try to break that habit. So, really, suit me if we never write a ticket for texting and driving. Uh, what I would like to do is to educate people on the dangers, and hopefully prevent it on the front end. Sure. Well, I think anybody that's been involved in an accident where somebody was texting or knows somebody that was texting, I don't know how many young people I talk to who, when I bring this up, oh, I. No, I would not text. I mean, there are plenty of them out there that are still doing it, but the the fear and to see what can happen is pretty frightening. Sure, but I, you know, and I, I'll tell you that, that actually the the ones who I've had the most support for have been younger people. Yeah. Um, because I think they realize more than a lot of us who are a little bit older just how dangerous it is. I mean, they, they realize how big the problem it is, and typically the people who I see, you know, when you when you're driving past people or you pull up to a stoplight, the people who I see texting are not the 
16 to 20, 25 year olds. It's it's older people. It's it's, it's people like me. Well, um, that's even more frightening, isn't it? Because you is. can't text as fast as they can. That's exactly right. <laughs> I can't believe how fast they can do something. It's like, well, did you write send it? Oh yeah, I sent it a minute ago. Yeah, no, yeah. that's right. I mean, a lot of these these younger folks can text quicker than they can. They can type, or, or some of them can, can text faster than they can talk. I think. And they don't even have to look at the phone. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it is crazy. Hey, I'm Ann Eller. I'm here with Senator Shane Massey. He's our guest for the hour. If you have a question or a comment, don't hesitate to pick up that phone. Give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. We'll be right back. This is fun. Yeah, this is, uh, this is what I do every day here, yeah. You got to show every day. Yeah. Every afternoon. Yeah. You have people in every day. Oh yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, most most every day. Yeah, unless I say I just can't take it anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> How long you been doing? I've been doing this since uh, 2007. Wow. Yeah, I won best radio show of the year for two years. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that. yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank that you is very really much. awesome. We already got one call. Okay. <laughs> They thought that uh, that uh, should be a driver's test for those over 80. <laughs> well, it must have been a 75-year-old that was calling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the guy said he's been trying to get keys away from his mom and dad for the last three years. And every time they go out, it's an adventure. Oh, man. But if you go over to Wesley Commons... Yeah. And you, you see, see a, a car, car without a dent. It looks like somebody walked around and took hammer and hammered all the way around <laughs> about the bumper height. Wow. You know, it would be less of a problem if there was more in our area if we had public transportation, but we yeah. don't. That, that's a, I mean, that's an issue all across the state. It's especially an issue in rural areas. Correct. Yeah. Well, Lander has a bus system. They didn't figure it'd be used. It's packed. Is it really? Yeah. yeah, they take them to all around to their apartments. Do they use it for non-students or is it just for the students? Just, just for students, well, yes. That's one of the problems. The employees that work there also like to use it. It's for sure. the students, but, the, you know, yeah, good intentions never quite work out the way you figure. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what that does, though, I think, is that it, it, it just reinforces the demand. Oh, yeah. there's, a, there's a high demand for that. Yeah. Why have you been sending all these historical photos of politicians out here lately? <laughs> I uh, <laughs> on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. I um, I think I follow uh, Michael Beschloss, who is a uh, presidential historian, and he, he typically does several photos every day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of them I think well, that's kind of cool, so I'll just. No, so you just retweet it? Yeah, okay. so I'm just retweeting it. Okay. I thought maybe living in Edgefield with uh, yeah, most it? governors, what was it, 10 governors? 10, ten governors. Well, it, is, it, it is in the water. So it may, you know, oh, my God, does that mean you're going to be a governor? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it, it does not mean that. <laughs> well, um, you were going to run for a house, right? For the congressional. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, and I, I enjoyed that. I think it was a good decision to get in. It was an even better decision to get, get out. out. Uh, I mean, I, I enjoy getting around, meeting people, talking about things, but I've got two young children, just had one at a time, and the longer that went on, the less and less I wanted to go to Washington. Uh, and plus, as my wife told me, I really like Jeff, so that made it easier for me. <laughs> Step back. Yeah. Oh, that's right. We're right back here, Sharp Facets Gallery. I am in my studio in the back talking with Senator Shane Massey this afternoon. And, of course, we've just uh, been talking a little bit about our young drivers, and then somebody called about some of the older drivers that are on, on the roads, you know. It is, it is kind of scary, but I tell you what, the scariest thing to me is this bypass with the center lane. Nobody seems to realize that's a get in the lane and just turn. It's not a drive or a passing lane. Well, that's the NASCAR lane. That's the NASCAR yeah. lane. That's, that's where you're supposed, to, you're supposed to pass and you play, you play chicken in there. Yeah. But no, I mean, that's, um, uh, you know, the more growth you have, the more traffic you have, the more, the more things you're going to have like that. Sure. And the fact that we are ending up with more and more retirees here in South Carolina, and uh, the, the longer we all are 
projected to live in everything, the more that is um, actually an issue. Well, and, you know, South Carolina markets uh, itself as, as a retirement destination. Yes. And, and I think we have to acknowledge the tremendous impact that retirees from all over the country have made uh, in moving to South Carolina. Um, and, and so I welcome them. I mean, I think sure. they've, been, they've been great. Um, I'd like to have more. Um, but with growth comes challenges. Uh, sure. No matter what that growth is, for sure. Sure. And of course, um, uh, and that's one of the issues that we're also dealing with in our health care sure. and, and, and all around. So it is a big challenge. I had several times um, had uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Glenn McConnell on, okay. and we talked about that. He became very passionate about our elder population and taking care of and respite care and all that kind of stuff. He, he was, and still is, a, a great advocate for uh, the, the elderly. I mean, he brought, he brought that attention to, to the forefront like no one before him had. Exactly. And, and I hope Lieutenant Governor McMaster will continue to shine the spotlight on that. Um, because, I mean, you know, Lieutenant Governor McConnell called it the gray tsunami. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the population across the country is aging. That's especially the case in South Carolina because, again, we market ourselves sure. um, as a retirement destination. Uh, so that's something that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, and the, the health care costs, particularly the Medicaid costs that go along with that, um, are something that we're going to have to have to plan for or else it will eat us up. Exactly. And of course, uh, you know, then we need to talk about um, our roads and our bridges because this is the this is the issue of the year. And uh, let's see, you brought up a little point. Nobody's up for election or re-election right now, so it's a good time for y'all to tackle this topic, right? Well, th that seems to be the consensus. Uh, <laughs> people want to move on it this year because it's not an election year, and and uh, the, the common wisdom is is that it would be much more difficult to vote for it next year than it would be this year. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that my folks are smart enough to know what I do this year in addition to what I do next year, so um, it doesn't really matter to me, but, uh, but, but it is a big problem, so the sooner you get it done, the better you're going to be able to address the problem. What, why, I mean, uh, we've seen a lot of things. We've seen the governor saying that she's willing to up it if there's a decrease on the income tax. We've seen a lot of proposals coming not only from the Senate but from the House. What is, in your mind, what is the issue that's going to make this come together? Well, what's going to have to happen are, um, are the, the sides are going to have to come together, and we're getting, we're getting close to that point. I mean, this debate has been very, very slow in progressing, but it, it is progressing to the point that now you have, on the Senate side, you've had a plan that's come out of the committee. You've had a plan come out of committee in the House, um, and so people are starting to show their cards. Uh, the, the plan that came out of the committee in the Senate is a uh, it's a straight up tax increase of eight hundred million dollars. Um, which, Whoa, I can't afford that one now. <laughs> well, uh, I think there are a lot of people who can't, and to me, that is that, that, that's just. I mean, how much an, does it cost me? That's an easy vote. Yeah. Um, okay. Right? Well, how much does it cost me? Was it a well, gas tax increase? It's or? a the, that that plan is a gas tax increase of twelve cents per gallon, phased in over a three year period. Um, it, it also increases the sales tax on vehicles, the, the cap, from $300 to $600. It also increases um, the fees that you and I pay to renew our driver's license every five or ten years, depending on what, the, what you're on. Um, and it increases the fees that we pay every two years to renew the registration for our vehicles. Mm -hmm. And it would impose uh, new fees on hybrid and alternative fuel vehicles as well. So you put all those things together and you, you get up around $800 million. It's a lot of money. Will it fix the problem? Um, it would, it would, well, it depends on how you define the problem. If, okay. the, if the problem is that we're not getting enough money into the road system, and, and I think that is a concern, um, then it would put a whole lot more money into the, in, into the roads and bridges. Um, that's more money than we're putting into roads and bridges now. Oh, sure. Um, and so it would certainly help in that regard. Okay. But there are other issues. So. But there are other issues. What are the other issues? Well, and, and the governor really highlighted those. I mean, you know, she's taken some heat. She's got had some support for her proposal. But her, her idea was, you know, not only do you need to, to raise some revenue for roads, um, and there are different ways you could do that. I mean, you could take some of the existing surpluses, use some of the existing budget that we have to put over there. 
uh, which many people have been resistant to do for some reason, or you can just raise revenue, uh, more taxes, more fees. Um, the uh, the other parts that are going to have to be considered are the governance at the Department of Transportation. Who's making the decisions about where the money is going to be spent and where is the money going to be spent? Uh, I, I well, tell it's people, always down on the coast. Come on now. Well, that, that, that's what I mean. I, I tell people, look, I, I'm, I'm willing to consider options to put more money into roads and bridges, but not if it's all going to the coast. Um, and I recognize they've got more traffic. They, they probably have more needs. I'm willing to give them a, a substantial portion of the money. I just don't want them to get all the money. Sure. Uh, I so, think they showed in the records that it has the second or third highest growth in the country. I oh think yeah. it was in the country. That's so, right. You know, it's know. interesting. If, if you look at the census maps in South Carolina from like 1990, 2000, to 2010, you see the migration in population towards the coast. I mean, it's kind of fascinating to, to see. So I mean, thought everybody left after Hugo, though. Yeah. Well, they've come back. <laughs> they've come back, yeah. <laughs> they've come back, and, and, and they brought family and friends with them. Uh, but, but uh, you know, there are challenges on the coast, but there are challenges elsewhere. Uh, so who makes those decisions about how that money gets spent and where it gets spent? That's, that's an important factor. Um, and that's right before us now because the, uh, the current structure, the current, current governance structure at the Department of Transportation is, is up for renewal this year or else we're going back, we revert back to an older structure. Uh, the other issue that, that's come up is, is whether we ought to consider some type of reduction in the income tax. Uh, the governor really brought that up, um, but the primary reason is that our, our income tax rates are higher than our neighbors. They're higher than North Carolina, they're higher than Georgia. Tennessee and Florida don't even have income tax. Um, so th those are all part of the discussion, and you know, the more things you throw in there, the more complicated it becomes, but those are all things that, that have to be considered. Well, I have not, and we'll kind of come back to this afterwards, I have not seen anybody uh, say, you know, let's go ahead and tackle the income tax issue and fix this broken hose. That, that, that's true. Well, and, and that's, I don't think it's because of a, of a, of a lack of, of wanting to do it. Um, it's because it's a hard problem. Uh, it's an election issue. Hey, we'll come back <laughs> and we'll talk about it in just a moment. Don't you go away. Right, right back here, Sharp Facets Gallery, Senator Shane Massey is in the building. And we were talking a little bit about the um, gas tax and uh, uh, where we're going with that. Do you, and, and the roads, you know, everybody seems to be up in arms about the roads. But there doesn't, is there the willingness this time to get something done? And the other issue is... How long does it take to get a project from A to done? I mean, we seem to have had a lot of uh, discussion. I've had several people on my show here that are engineers and whatnot talking about how difficult it is to work with the DOT. So what is, number one, how can uh, the Department of Transportation become more efficient at moving things through? And number two, um, we talked about how the money going down to the coast. How do you decide how the money is spent? Well, uh, on the efficiency question first, I mean, I think like we can all be more efficient in what we do, um, and I think it's important to to have. You know, we were talking off the air about the importance of having somebody look over your shoulder and, and having having that review. Um, and and last year, with some restructuring legislation that we passed, it, we included a requirement for the legislature to conduct regular legislative oversight of the, the various agencies. And I think that's important because it's important that we know what's going on. And it's important that they know that we're looking at them. Sure. So I think that'll help efficiency to some degree. But leadership matters. Um, having, having a leadership team that's going to be um, consistently looking at ways to improve, that certainly matters. Um, and the DOT, I mean, you know, they, they get a bad rap lots of times and they're easy to pick on. And sometimes it's deserved, but lots of times they are limited by what the federal regulations are because they have to comply with those on many of the roadways. Um, it, you know, there's been some talk about if we're going to put more money there that we should actually send it to the counties as opposed to the, to the DOT because the county doesn't have to deal with all these federal requirements. Counties can pave roads a whole lot cheaper. Oh, you've can. just opened up the spigot here now because oh, yeah. y'all haven't sent that money back to our cities and counties that should have it's, been sent back. Do you think the counties are going to say, sure, we'll handle our own roads? No, no. no. In fact, I, I, told, I told them that I wouldn't trust us to give them the money. 
uh, <laughs> because of the way that the way that the legislature has acted on the local government fund. Um, but, but but one benefit of, of sending money to the road to the counties to deal with roads is that the local county transportation committees can do it much cheaper. The problem though about this idea of transferring roads to the counties for for maintenance is that many of these counties, especially where I represent, these rural counties, they don't have the equipment to do that. Sure. Um, they don't have the resources they need to do that. And they can't rely on the state to give them the money as promised because, well, we haven't done it. We don't have a very good reputation on that, do Over you? the last few years, we don't. And yeah. that's and it's a well-deserved bad reputation. Right, exactly. Now, one of the other things, though, is the amount of roads that we have here in South Carolina is phenomenal. That's right. And how, um, what are we, fourth in the nation or something, I, I think? I think we have the fourth largest state-maintained roadway system in the country. And when you look at Texas, that's really hard to believe, isn't it? Right. And I don't know, you know, I don't know what Texas and, and California and some of these larger states do as far as who's in control of their roads. But it is, it, it is incredible to think that South Carolina, when you look at the, just how big we are, that we are the fourth largest state maintained roadway system. Sure. You know, I think the other thing is, how do you decide which project is more important? I mean, you know, we, it seems to me, you know, we've got some bridges that are, you know, basically crumbling. I know having had a conversation with Governor Haley about it's a lot more than just repairing the bridge because that involves sewer and water and all this kind of stuff running through it, electrical. So how do, you, how do they make a decision or how can a decision be made that so that we know, okay, we're getting X amount of dollars and it's not all going to the, to the uh, coast, that we have this project so it's going to happen in this project. How does that decision get made? Do you know, Shane? Well, you know, since I think a couple of years before I was elected, there was some restructuring that went in over at the Department of Transportation. And included in that was a statutory criteria for the department to use in prioritizing which roads are getting getting fixed, and which bridges are going to be repaired? Uh, you know, it used to be that you could just call up your state senator, and the state senator would call the DOT and say, "Hey, pave this road over here," and it would get done. All right? That doesn't happen anymore, uh, and that's that's good and bad. Right. Um, but but, uh, but 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 the good part of it is is that these decisions are they have to be made based on engineering criteria, and there's there's criteria set out in the law that they have to follow, and they look at these things from a statewide basis. And they rank them, mm -hmm. and so then they perform those projects as they are ranked, uh, and th and that's a good thing. The, the the difficulty there is for those of us who live in the smaller communities, we very rarely rank near the top uh, because we don't have the traffic counts right. that a lot of these other places have. But um, that's the way the Department of Transportation operates. They're they're bound by that law. Then you got the State Transportation Infrastructure Bank that is not bound by that, which is why you see all those big money projects going to the coast or to Florence or to Greenville. Hmm. Is there hope this year for this problem? No, I think there's hope. I think it's a um, it, it's a difficult challenge, um, but I'm, uh, I'm I'm optimistic that we can get people together. Uh, we are pretty far apart at this point, but, but I do think I see movement towards actually getting there. Uh, it's, like I said earlier, it's been a slow process, um, but. It, I think we're moving in that direction. I hope we can get it done this year. I think it needs to be done this year. Um, the devil's in the details. Sure. And of course, then it, um, <clears throat> what do you think as far as Governor Haley on working together with the legislature to get this done? But look, I, I mean, I, I've worked with the governor on, uh, on several things over the past few years, and, and I've worked with her very well. Um, I think she's done a good job at, 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 at governing and trying to get some of these big issues passed. The Department of Administration, the restructuring legislation was a huge obstacle last year. and We got that done and I, and I saw some pretty impressive things out of her office. Um, that, and, and she gets engaged in, in various issues and um, she has her own way of governing. And what she likes to do, I think what we've seen across the state, is that she likes to appeal directly to the people. Mm -hmm. and, and say, you know, look, th this is what I think is important. You elected me to, for my vision. This is what I think is important, and I'd like for you to contact your legislature to, legislator to have them move on this. Sometimes that's effective, sometimes it's not. Um, but, uh, but, but she's, uh, she, 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 is, she picks a few issues and really goes gung-ho on those issues. 
She puts her stiletto heels on. She she is not afraid to use her heels. I, I, <laughs> I, I agree. Look, she is a tough lady, mm -hmm. um, and and she is she is very smart. Um, she's tough, and uh, she she is true to what she tells people, um, and she fights for those issues. Sure. Well, we'll uh, we certainly hope that it will be something, and I do think people need to call and talk to their legislatures. You do need, whether you're at, you're at town halls around the around the state or however it's coming together, you do need to let them know that this needs to be accomplished. It's going to be important for the future of the growth of our state. No question. I'll tell you, you know, I've held I held seven town hall meetings across my district over the last three weeks. This issue dominated every one of them. Yes. And now, Whit has dominated here with us on Meet Me at the Diner. Hey, let's hear a quick word from our sponsors. We'll be back. I'm going to find something else to talk about. We got other issues here. Hey, we'll be right back. Um, are you a pirate or a pack rat? Do you have a vacation of a lifetime sitting in the attic? Or a college tuition hung on a wall? Or is a fabulous retirement hidden in your jewelry box? Bring those items to Sharp Facets Gallery. We can establish value and buy from you or sell for you. And so ends another chapter at Sharp Facets Gallery. 72 Bypass and on the web, sharpfacets.com. Oh, that's right. We're back here. We're here with Senator Shane Massey. Now, uh, Shane, your actual district is Edgefield, McCormick, Aiken, Saluda, Lexington. Saluda. Yeah, Saluda. You got and how much of Lexington do you have? I have uh, about twenty-five thousand people. I, I've got the Gilbert Summit area. I have uh, actually going to downtown Lexington. Uh, wow. So it's a it's a good number of people. Now, as far as the total part of Lexington, Lexington's huge. So right. it's, I don't have a whole lot of that percentage wise. But I got about twenty-five thousand people over there. Yeah, you know, I I, I was uh, I was curious. Um, you know, 10 governors have come out of Edgefield County. Yeah. 10. Where do you live? <laughs> I, I live right in Edgefield. <laughs> is there something in the water, Shane, or what do you yeah. think it is? No, there's definitely something in the water. You know, Edgefield, Edgefield has a, a, a great history. Um, there's been a lot of written about it, um, but it really is fascinating, all the things that have gone over there. Of course, you know, Edgefield, as we know it now, used to be much larger, right, because it used to include portions of... Of, of other counties and so some of those 10 governors didn't actually live in what we now recognize to be Edgefield but they were then part of the Edgefield district um, but we've had some great history over there and of course our last governor was was Strom Thurmond so it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> hey you know I would just want to just touch on what's happening over there with the uh, NWT at the Turkey Federation over there. Huge Incredible. growth. I mean, would you have ever believed that that would happen right there in Edgefield and how that must be affecting the employment or futuristically is going to affect the employment over there? It's incredible. I mean, it's really exciting to to, to see uh, all the things that are going on over there. I mean, it's a, it, the, the Turkey Federation, I mean, it's the national headquarters in Edgefield and it is already a significant private employer in the county. Um, and they're looking at major expansions that are going to bring in people uh, from all over the country to right. participate in different activities. It's going to have a huge impact, and I think it's going to be bigger than just Edgefield. People are going to be going to all the places around us. Um, so it really is exciting. They've got some great leadership, and they're doing some, some exciting things. Sure, and they have, uh, in fact, I'm supposed to be going over there May 19th, I think it is. They're having a big unveiling of a That's lot right. of things over there. So we're going to be over there broadcasting on that. Right, yeah. yeah, and I tell you, the other thing that I think is pretty interesting is the pottery department with Piedmont Tech. That, that's right. You know, Edgefield, part of the history, we were just talking about a little while ago, but, but part of the history of Edgefield is that, that it was significant uh, for pottery. And uh, a lot of the more expensive pieces that are floating around came out of Edgefield. Uh, and so Piedmont Tech has, uh, has taken that on, and uh, they, they work with, with pottery. And we still have some potters over there um, yeah. still selling pottery. So it's really... It's cool. It's it really is. Neat, yeah. It is. And it's uh, worth taking a trip over there. Absolutely. And, Come and, on over. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, as we kind of try to wind this up, one of the big issues is, of course, education. How are we going to equalize our teach our different districts to get the right type of education so that all our students are on a par? You know, that's one of the things that um, 
the state of South Carolina, in fact, the United States is charged with is a good education for all of our students. How do we do that, Shane, and what can you tell us about what's happening there? Well, I mean, that's a that's an even more difficult challenge to address than, than finding ways to fix our roads and bridges. Um, because things are different depending on where you where you live. Mm -hmm. uh, we have different industrial tax bases in, in different different school districts. You have different residential tax bases, and those things matter. Um, we have gotten over the last several years more towards providing education funds from the state as opposed to just relying exclusively on local dollars. So that has some equalization effect. Um, and in the district that I represent, you see that in McCormick where um, the you know, they, they used to be exclusively based on local property taxes, and now with the influx of, of state dollars, they've been able to do things that they weren't able to do before. Um, and and that's, that's the case in lots of rural areas, but uh, you still have a lot of areas that just don't have the opportunities Correct. that other areas have. Um, and, and so, you know, what we've done just in the last few years, I mean, we've expanded the 4K program, Mm -hmm. to many, many more children across the state. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of evidence that, that that is a big factor, getting to these children early uh, so that they can do better as they go along. Um, we started last year, we put more money in the budget for technology, especially for the rural school districts, uh, to try to bring them up to where some of our wealthier districts are. Um, but this is not something that's gonna be solved overnight. Uh, this is a, a long-term process and um, it, it's probably, it's gonna require us to spend money more wisely. Well, you know, I know one of the things that was, uh, that is an issue about is uh, school consolidation. Why, why, why are we looking at that as a, as a way to make things better? Well, that's a- uh, County, uh, it's county con consolidation. Th that's right, well, that's, a, that's a touchy, touchy subject up here, isn't it? Well, kind of, yeah, I think, yeah. Kinda, I thought I'd bring it up here. We've got six minutes. <laughs> Um, it, uh, I, mean, I, th I think the reason it's come up is th that if they're consolidated, you're not spending as much money on administration or you're not spending as much money at the district offices, um, and you're probably duplicating some services. And there's probably some validity to that. You also have, um, in, in some areas here, um, I mean, in, in the, the 96 area is a great example, um, where you you have folks who are able to do some pretty impressive things at the local level that they probably would not be able to do if they were swallowed up by a larger district. Sure. Um, so, so, I mean, I think there's merit on both sides of this one, but, it, but it's something that we at least have to consider if we're, gonna, if we're gonna really seriously take a look at trying to address our educational divisions. Do you think that um, they should be by um, county? Um, well, I mean, my, my preference would probably be yes. Okay. Um, because uh, I think that's probably the more efficient way to do it. Um, but you give up a lot when you do that. Uh, sure. I mean, you really do. And I think that would be felt here more so than, than lots of other places. Um, but, I mean, you, you know, you've got some counties that have many different districts. I mean, I represent portions of Lexington that we said they've got several districts over there. Um, and they're probably all thriving. Well, no, no, they're, they're not. They're, not? they're actually, it's actually very interesting. If you look at uh, the difference between Lexington 1 and then the district that includes the Swansea area, the state newspaper did an article about that not too long ago showing just how different they are um, because they've got different tax bases. Mm -hmm. um, but, but then you go to Greenville County, for instance, and Greenville County is it's, it's the largest population county in the state, and they're all one consolidated school district, and it works very well up there. Um, but, I mean, you know, we... People are resistant to change sometimes, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know I think we've got to look at it from a statewide basis to see what the best way is for us to use our limited resources that we have uh, to, to try to educate as many people as possible. You know, Shane, one of the things that was before the before the before the Senate and the House that uh, kind of died was uh, when Governor Nikki Haley wanted to, said that she would veto the bond issue. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about that? Well, it, and, you know, the House struck it out before it ever got to the Senate, although I think there's going to be a, a, an attempt to perform an Easter miracle and, and resurrect it on the, <laughs> in the Senate. Um, I, look, I, I understand the idea that money is cheap right now and that, and that the, the interest rates are at historic lows. But and I, also, aren't you just getting ready to retire a bond? That's right. Yes, um, okay. But when I take a step back, here's something that I see that concerns me. 
we've got almost $400 million in surplus revenue this year. We're going to spend all of it. There's talk about raising taxes significantly. I told you the Senate bill's got $800 million in tax increases. And then the proposal is that we're going to borrow a significant amount of money on top of that. I take a step back and I look at those things and I'm thinking, what in the world are we doing? Um, Becoming like Washington? No, yeah, I, mean, it's, I didn't say that. Well, I, I, fortunately we have the balanced budget requirement so we can't we can't get to that degree. Look, I, I understand there are needs. I understand there are a whole lot more wants. Um, and you can make a good case for anything. But I think it's important that we understand the impact that it's going to have on people, mm -hmm. uh, the impact it's going to have on taxpayers. And we've got to try to do things the best way possible. When I've talked to people across the state, they want their roads fixed. Mm -hmm. um, and many people tell me they're willing to pay more to make that happen, as long as they know the money's going to be spent efficiently. Um, but I think if you, you start doing other things, too, then I, it becomes a little questionable in my mind. I mean, I'm open to listen to anybody, um, but all those things together seem to me to be a little bit too much. Well, how much do we keep in a rainy day fund? Well, fortunately, we've got more now than we right. used to have um, because, it, you know, when we hit the recession in 2008, we, we, we went through all of our, I mean, you know, the, well, the, the financial collapse happened in September by the end of that calendar year. The end of that calendar year, we had gone through all of our reserves. And then we, and, and the schools and the local governments can tell you that right. more specifically because they started having all sorts of cuts. So we did amend our constitution, I think it was in 2010, to require us to save more money. That's a good thing. Um, so we've got several hundred million dollars saved up, but I still don't think it's enough. I mean, I probably am a little more conservative on that than, than, than most people. I think we should save more money. Well, um, if we have this extra money, why don't we send it back to the cities and the counties? Well, it, I don't think you want to deplete your reserves. No, not re deplete, right? but you've said you've got a surplus. That's right. They have, they have been waiting for this money. And, and we're going we're gonna to have that fight on the Senate floor. I guarantee we had it last year. We'll have it again. Um, we lost last year. We'll probably lose again. Um, what because, a positive attitude here, Shane. <laughs> well, because, I mean, that, you know, you look this, I mean, I can count. I, I, know, where the, count? I okay. know where the votes are. Right. Um, but but what, what's happened is over the last few years, especially when we've had surplus revenues, um, Medicaid has taken a significant portion of that because even though we did not expand Medicaid pursuant to the Affordable Care Act, um, our Medicare expenses have been increasing dramatically, and we can't get a hold of our existing program. That we put more money into K-12, uh, even though some people don't like to say that. I mean, the truth is we have put more money into K-12, not as much as they'd like, but mm -hmm. we've put more money over there. Um, and then there are all sorts of different things that we want to spend money on uh, collectively as, as a General Assembly. And so those things take up all the money. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is WCRS right here in Greenwood. Shane, is there anything else that we didn't cover that you'd just like to address here? Oh, man, we could go on for hours. I know, we this could. Is, but this, is, this has been a lot of fun. Maybe I can come back sometime and we can absolutely. talk about some more issues. I really enjoy that. All right, well, we can do that. Listen, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, come by and see us. I sure hope you have a happy Easter. You too. Thank you very much. And I certainly hope there's some Easter miracles down there in <laughs> Columbia. <laughs> we'll take whatever we can get. Absolutely. Hey, this is WCRS right here in Greenwood. Bye-bye, everybody.